Hello again. Uh, I have retrieved my dachshund, so we should be good to go this time. Like I was saying, uh, today I'm going to be reading Oxcart Man, and it follows the story of a farmer and his family from the early 19th century in New Hampshire as they uh, go through an entire year of farming. This is one of my favorite books when I was a kid because the pictures are just beautiful. And like I was saying before, it did win the Caldecott Medal in 1970. So it's a beautiful book. I think my parents discovered it on Reading Rainbow. That's where I think they got a lot of the books that I had in my library as a kid. But this one was always one of my very favorites. So I hope you like it as well. I will try and make sure that everyone can see the pictures while I read. But we may have some upside down reading adventures as well. So, here we go. Here's the first picture. This is the ox cart man and his farm. In October, he backed his ox into his cart and he and his family filled it up with everything they made or grew all year long that was left over. He packed a bag of wool he sheared from the sheep in April. He packed a shawl his wife wove on a loom from yarn spun at the spinning wheel from sheep sheared in April. He packed five pairs of mittens his daughter knit from yarn spun at the spinning wheel from sheep sheared in April. He packed candles the family made. He packed linen made from flax they grew. He packed shingles he split himself. He packed birch brooms his son carved with a barred kitchen knife. He packed potatoes they dug from their garden, but first he counted out potatoes enough to eat all winter and potatoes for seed next spring. He packed a barrel of apples, honey and honeycombs, turnips and cabbages, a wooden box of maple sugar from the maples they tapped in March, when they boiled and boiled and boiled the sap away. He packed a bag of goose feathers that his children collected from the barnyard geese. When his cart was full, he waved goodbye to his wife, his daughter, and his son, and wa he walked at his ox's head ten days over hills, through valleys, by streams, past farms and villages. Until he came to Portsmouth and Portsmouth Market. And there we have Portsmouth and Portsmouth Market. He sold the bag of wool. He sold the shawl his wife made. He sold five pairs of mittens. He sold candles and shingles. He sold birch brooms. He sold potatoes. He sold apples. He sold honey and honeycombs, turnips and cabbages. He sold maple sugar. He sold a bag of goose feathers. Then he sold the wooden box he carried the maple sugar in. Then he sold the barrel he carried the apples in. Then. He sold the bag he carried the potatoes in. Then he sold his ox cart. Then he sold his ox and kissed him goodbye on his nose. Then he sold his ox's yoke and harness. With his pockets full of coins, he walked through Portsmouth Market. He bought an iron kettle to hang over the fire at home. And for his daughter, he bought an embroidery needle that came from a boat in the harbor that had sailed all the way from England. And for his son, he bought a barlow knife for carving birch brooms with. And for the whole family, he bought two pounds of wintergreen peppermint candies. Then he walked home with the needle and the knife and the wintergreen peppermint candies tucked into the kettle. And a stick over his shoulder stuck through the kettle's handle and coins still in his pockets. Here he is. 
He's very small in the landscape. He walked past farms and villages, over hills, through valleys, by streams, until he came to his farm. And his son and his daughter and his wife were waiting for him. And his daughter took her needle and began stitching. And his son took his barlow knife and started whittling. And they cooked dinner in their new kettle. And afterward, everyone ate a wintergreen peppermint candy. And that night, the ox cart man sat in front of his fire, stitching new harness for the young ox in the barn. And he carved a new yoke and sawed planks for a new cart and split shingles all winter. While his wife made flax into linen all winter, and his daughter embroidered linen all winter, and his son carved Indian brooms from birch all winter, and everybody made candles. And in March, they tapped the sugar maple trees and boiled the sap down. And in April, they sheared the sheep, spun yarn, and wove and knitted. And in May, they planted potatoes, turnips, and cabbages, while apple blossoms bloomed and fell, while bees woke up, starting to make new honey. And geese squawked in the barnyards, dropping feathers as soft as clouds. And that is the end of The Ox Cart Man. I really like that book because I think it's almost like a poem with the illustrations and how cyclical and quiet everything is. I always found it a very soothing book when I was a child. So hopefully you all do as well. Now for the second half, as always, we will read some Paddington Bear. Also, if you have requests of any kind of books that you would like me to read, please let me know and I will see what I can do. Um, right now, the books that I buy, I'm planning to donate to a charity after I have finished reading them. So I definitely don't mind buying new books and as they will go to a good cause after I am finished with them. So today's chapter is chapter eight, Paddington in a Hole. Mrs. Brown turned away from the hall mirror and made a face as the sound of hammering rent the morning air. I suppose I mustn't grumble, she said. Henry has been making enough noise himself these past few weeks, but I do wish Mr. Curry would hurry up and finish all his jobs. He does go on. I wouldn't mind, said Mrs. Bird, if they were his own ideas in the first place, but he must always go copying other people. He's even talking now of putting a serving hatch in his kitchen wall. Mrs. Bird gave one of her Mr. Curry snorts as she put some finishing touches to her hat. The Brown's neighbor, apart from having a reputation in the district for his meanness, also had a habit of copying other people, and living next door to him, the Brown suffered more than most. Recently, Mr. Brown had carried out quite a number of jobs in and round their house. Apart from decorating several of the rooms, he'd also laid a concrete path in the back garden and installed a serving hatch between their kitchen and the dining room. Mr. Curry had had a hard time keeping up with all the activity in Number 32 Winter Gardens, but only the day before he'd announced in a very loud voice his intention of carrying out the last two tasks himself in the near future, and that very morning he'd arrived in his back garden dressed in old overalls in order to make preparations for the path. I must say, began Mrs. Brown, there are times when I find taking the family all the way across London just to visit the dentist a bit of nuisance, but I shan't be at all sorry today. She gave a sigh as another burst of hammering echoed between the two buildings. Are you sure you don't want to come with us, Paddington? She called. Paddington hurried into the hall at the sound of his name. <clears throat> uh, no, thank you, Mrs. Brown, he exclaimed when she repeated her question. Although he'd never actually been to a dentist, he didn't like the sound of them at all, especially after listening to some of Jonathan's graphic descriptions of what went on. I think perhaps I'll stay at home and sit in the garden instead, he announced before anyone could try to change his mind for him.
Mrs. Brown eyed the retreating figure of Paddington as he disappeared into the dining room. You know, it's an extraordinary thing, she remarked, but I do believe he's turned over a new leaf. Do you realize we haven't had a single disaster for some time? Not one! Mrs. Bird hastily touched wood as she made for the front door. Don't tempt fate, she warned. That young bear doesn't need any encouragement. Mrs. Bird was not at all happy about leaving Paddington alone in the house. She had decided views about his various activities, and the fact that nothing untoward had happened for a while left her unmoved. But even the Browns' housekeeper would have found it hard to fault Paddington's behavior, at least for the next few minutes or so, had she been there to see it. Having finished breakfast, Paddington carefully wiped his whiskers on the napkin provided by a hopeful Mrs. Brown, and then made his way through the French windows and out onto the terrace, where he stood for a moment sniffing the morning air. Paddington liked the summer, especially in Mr. Brown's garden, which for a London garden was unusually large and full of flowers and shrubs, each with its own special smell. But the peace of Paddington's morning was short-lived, for just as he was making some last-minute adjustments to a deck chair so that he could sit down for a while and enjoy the morning sunshine, a familiar voice rang out over the fence. "'Good morning, bear,' said the voice. Paddington jumped up. "'Good morning, Mr. Curry,' he said doubtfully, raising his hat politely. But for once the Brown's neighbor didn't seem to be in an unusually cheerful mood, and if he didn't actually beam at Paddington, at least his lips cracked in something approaching a smile as he looked over his fence. Mr. Curry waved a large mallet in Paddington's direction. I wonder if you'd care to lend a paw, Bear, he said casually. I'm putting in some stakes, and it's a bit difficult with only one pair of hands. His voice droned on about his various jobs that needed to be done as he helped Paddington through a hole in the fence. Now, I've marked the positions where I want them all, he continued as Paddington stood up. There are 150 altogether. I'll just show you what I want done, and then you can carry on while I go out and do my shopping. I want to get some paint for my new serving hatch when it's in. Mr. Curry paused for breath. I don't suppose you'll get all the stakes in before I'm back, but if you do, you can collect some rubble for me. As for the foundations, and I'm running a bit short. In fact, I might even pay you if you do. Mind you, he added, before Paddington had any time to speak, I shan't pay if it's not proper brick rubble. Don't want to come back home and find half my rockery missing. Now come along, bear, he growled sternly as he had handed Paddington the mallet. Don't just stand there. I've got a lot of shopping to do, and I want to get out this morning. Mr. Curry picked up a stake from a nearby pile and then pushed it firmly into the ground with both hands. Now, he said, when I nod my head, you hit it. For a moment, Paddington looked at Mr. Curry as if he could hardly believe his ears. And then, as the Brown's neighbor closed his eyes and began nodding his head vigorously to show that he was ready, he took a firm grasp of the mallet with both paws. A moment later, a yell of pain rang out round Winter Gardens, echoing and re-echoing in and out of the buildings. Paddington jumped back in alarm, and the mallet fell unheeded from his paws as, to his surprise, instead of looking pleased, Mr. Curry let go of the stake, gave another tremendous yell, and then began dancing up and down, clenching his head with both hands. Bear! he roared as Paddington disappeared through the hole in the fence. Bear! Where are you, bear? Come back, bear! But Paddington was nowhere to be seen. Only the faintest movement of the raspberry canes portrayed his whereabouts, and a few moments later even that stopped as Mr. Curry peered over the fence before staggering back up the garden toward his house. For the next few minutes, the distant sound of banging doors and the hiss of running water greeted Paddington's ears. But at long last, a final and much louder bang from the front of Mr. Curry's house caused him to heave a sigh of relief as he stood up and brushed himself clean. Paddington hesitated for a moment and then climbed back through the hole in the fence and stared gloomily at the beginnings of Mr. Curry's path. The Brown's neighbor had a habit of twisting words so that his listeners were never quite certain what had actually been said, but he was almost sure he hadn't agreed to lend a paw with one of the stakes, let alone do all 150 by himself. Now that he had time to examine it more carefully, the pile of stakes looked even bigger than it had at first sight. Not only that, but to add to his troubles, Mr. Curry a appeared to have taken the mallet away with him. After making several attempts to knock in some stakes with the aid of half a brick, Paddington gave up in disgust and hurried up the path in the direction of Mr. Curry's house. In his haste, the Brown's neighbor had left his back door ajar, and a few moments later, Paddington let himself cautiously into the kitchen.
The curtains were drawn, and as he blinked in order to accustom his eyes to the change of light, Paddington suddenly stopped in his tracks and stared in astonishment, all thoughts of the missing mallet driven from his mind. It was some while since he'd last set foot in Mr. Curry's kitchen, and from the little he could remember of it, the decorations then had been mostly of a rather dirty brown, certainly nothing like the ones that greeted him now. In fact, all in all, apart from a bag of tools in one corner and one or two obviously unfinished patches, it now looked not unlike something out of one of Mrs. Brown's glossy magazines, or even, for that matter, Mrs. Brown's own freshly decorated kitchen itself. The walls were gleaming white, the floor black and equally shiny, and even the stove and the refrigerator looked new. It was as he stood taking it all in that a thoughtful expression gradually came over Paddington's face. Leaning against one of the walls was a wooden frame and a pair of doors, and seeing it reminded him of a remark passed by Mr. Curry as he'd helped him through the fence. "'I'm on the last lap in my kitchen, Bear,' he said. "'There's only the serving hatch to put in, and the job will be done.' Mr. Curry had gone on to grumble about the number of unfinished jobs he had had on hand, but at the time Paddington had been too busy worrying about the steak to take much notice. However, the more he thought about the matter now, the more it seemed like a golden opportunity to make amends for the unfortunate accident earlier in the day. A few minutes later, the sound of hammering could be heard in Windsor Gardens. It was followed shortly afterwards by the dull thud of a falling brick, the first of many which gradually found their way from inside the kitchen to a large pile outside the back door. Paddington felt sure from the little Mr. Curry had said about all his jobs that he couldn't fail to be pleased if he arrived home later that morning and found his serving hatch already installed. And even if the hatch wasn't in place, he couldn't possibly find anything to grumble at having a start made in the hole. Apart from that, knocking down walls was much more enjoyable work than banging in states. Once a start had been made by removing the first brick, which had taken rather a lot of hammering with a chisel, it was more a matter of clouching everything in sight as hard as possible, and standing back every now and then to avoid being hit by some of the larger lumps as they parted company with the rest. And here we see Paddington doing his work. Soon, the air was so thick with dust it became almost impossible to see, but as the last brick fell to the floor, Paddington surveyed the result of his labors as best as he could through half-closed eyes, and then measured the space carefully with his paws in order to make sure it was the right size. After placing the frame gently into position, and making it secure by jamming a couple of pieces of wood in either side, he slipped the doors into their grooves and then stood back, waiting for the dust to settle so that he could inspect his handiwork. As the air gradually cleared, Paddington began to look more and more pleased with himself. Admittedly, the hatch wasn't perfectly level, and there were one or two unfortunate paw marks on the surrounding wall, but those two things apart, he decided it was one of the best jobs he could ever remember doing, and he felt sure Mr. Curry would be equally pleased when he saw it. Dipping his paw into a nearby jaw of marmalade, he idly pushed one of the doors to one side in order to make sure it slid properly on its runners. As he did so, the pleased expression suddenly drained from Paddington's face, and he nearly toppled over backwards with surprise as he took in the view through the open hatch. And here is what Paddington saw. Since he had lived with the Browns, he'd examined number 32 Windsor Gardens from a good many different angles, but never in his wildest dreams had he ever pictured seeing it through a serving hatch in Mr. Curry's kitchen wall particularly when he'd expected to see a dining room instead. For a moment, Paddington stood where he was with his feet frozen to the ground, and then he hurried outside, rubbing his eyes in order to make sure it wasn't part of some terrible dream. As he peered up at the outside wall, Paddington's worst fears were realized, and gradually the truth of the matter dawned on him. In his hurry to complete the job, he had quite forgotten the fact that, although Mr. Curry's was exactly the same in most respects as the Brown's, because it was next door, everything was the other way around. So what was the dining room wall in the Brown's house became the outside wall in Mr. Curry's. Paddington's face grew longer and longer as he considered the matter. According to Mrs. Bird, Mr. Gurry had been doing quite a few jobs in his house of late, but for the life of him, Paddington couldn't think of a single good reason why he would possibly want a serving hatch in his outside wall. There were still several pieces of brick lying on the ground where they had fallen, but after one or two attempts, he soon gave up all hope of fitting them back into position. How long he stayed lost in thought, Paddington wasn't quite sure, but he was suddenly roused from his daydreams by the sound of Mr. Curry's side gate banging shut. 
Hurrying around to the back of the house, he was just in time to meet the Browns' neighbor coming round the other way. Apart from a bandage on the back of his head, Mr. Curry looked little the worse for wear for his earlier encounter with Paddington. Nevertheless, his face darkened as they bumped into each other. "'What are you up to now, bear?' he growled. "'What am I up to, Mr. Curry?' said Paddington, playing for time. Mr. Curry looked suspiciously at the brick dust sticking to Paddington's fur, and then, as he caught sight of the pile of brick rubble outside the kitchen door, his face suddenly cleared. "'Good work, bear!' he said approvingly as he felt in his pocket. "'I promise to pay you, and I must say you've earned it.' "'Thank you very much, Mr. Curry,' doubtfully, said Paddington doubtfully as he took the coin. "'I'll keep it for a while, in case you want it back.' "'What?' exclaimed Mr. Curry. "'Nonsense! Of course I shan't want it back.' This rubble's just what I need for my path. I I don't think you should use it for your path, Mr. Curry, said Paddington anxiously. You may want it for something else. Mr. Curry gave a loud snort as he picked up his shovel. Not use it, he repeated. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't, bear. Paddington looked on unhappily as Mr. Curry transferred the pile of rubble into a nearby trench, and when, some while later, the Brown's neighbor poured a barrow load of wet cement over the top, he looked unhappier still. There, said Mr. Curry, rubbing his hands together. That won't come up again in a hurry once it's set. He turned, but for the second time that morning found himself addressing the empty air, for his audience, like the brick rubble, had completely disappeared from view. Paddington felt sure he could give the Brown's neighbor not one, but several very good reasons why he shouldn't have used the bricks he found outside his kitchen door. On the other hand, he was equally sure he would be much happier if Mr. Curry discovered the reasons for himself, preferably sometime in the dim and distant future, and certainly when the cause of it all was a long, long way away. Paddington sat up in bed, holding a thermometer in his paw. <coughs> I think I must have caught the measles, Mrs. Bird he announced weakly. My temperature's over 120. 120? Mrs. Bird hurriedly examined the thermometer. That's not a temperature, she exclaimed with relief. That's a marmalade stain. Mrs. Brown looked Paddington over carefully. He's certainly got some red spots on him, she said. It's a bit tef difficult to tell with fur, but I suppose it could be measles. Hmm, said Mrs. Bird suspiciously. That's as may be, but it's the first time I've ever known measles spots to come off on the sheets. Perhaps they've worked loose, Mrs. Bird, said Paddington hopefully. I've been scratching them. Mrs. Brown ex exchanged a dark glance with her housekeeper. It looks more like brick dust to me, she said. Mrs. Bird glanced out of the window towards the house next door. Talking of brick dust, she said, reminds me that Mr. Curry called to see you just now, Paddington. Oh dear, said Mrs. Brown as a loud groan came from the direction of Paddington's bed. Is anything the matter? I, <clears throat> I think I've had a bit of a relapse, Mrs. Brown, said a weak voice from under the sheet. I, <clears throat> I don't think I ought to do any more talking. That's a pity, said Mrs. Bird. He asked me to give you pe fifty pence. Fifty pence, exclaimed Paddington, sitting up in bed suddenly. But I've already had fifty pence. In that case, said Mrs. Bird, you've got a pound. Apparently, he's very pleased with his new delivery hatch, explained Mrs. Brown. All sorts of people have been congratulating him. The milkman, the baker, the boy from the grocery shop. They all think it's a splendid idea. Mr. Curry is going to build a cupboard inside so that they can leave things and he won't have to answer the door. There'll be no holding him down now that he's got someone no one else has thought of, said Mrs. Bird. He'll be like a dog with two tails. You mark my words, we shall hear of nothing else from morning to night. It certainly is a good idea, said Mrs. Brown as she paused at the door. Mind you, she continued, I can't help feeling it's a good job Judy managed to catch the milkman when she did. And that Jonathan had a chat with the baker, added Mrs. Bird. Otherwise, said Mrs. Brown, I might not have thought to have a word with the grocery boy. And where, said her housekeeper, would we have been then? Mrs. Bird looked towards Paddington's bed, but the only answer she relieved was a loud groan, as its occupant appeared to have had a sudden relapse. All the same, 
Although his groans went, it was a long and rather blood-curdling one. There was something about the set of Paddington's whiskers as they poked out from beneath the sheets, which somehow managed to suggest the possibility of a recovery in the not-too-distant future. "'I give it until tea time at the outside,' said Mrs. Brown as she closed the door. "'If not before,' agreed Mrs. Bird. "'I'm baking a chocolate cake for tea.' "'In that case,' said Mrs. Brown, "'definitely before.' There's nothing like a few whiffs of chocolate cake up the stairs for curing even the worst attack of a young bear's measles. And that is the end of the chapter. So I hope you enjoyed these books. I will be reading more, hopefully at the actual time of noon tomorrow, uh, but certainly thereabouts. And um, let me know if you think of any other stories you would like me to read. Okay, thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day. Bye!